good, good evening, everyone. Okay, welcome. Uh, it's, um, uh, I think we're going to have a, uh, a really good talk tonight. We've got a perfect guest speaker. I just wanted to start by first thanking all of you for coming out here uh, on a winter night uh, to, uh, to take advantage of this presentation. Uh, before I get to our uh, guest speaker, I'd like to just make a couple of quick uh, housekeeping announcements. First off, I think most of you are aware that there's uh, attendance sign-in sheets over here. If you didn't get a chance to sign in, uh, don't worry about it now. Just before you leave, go uh, uh, sign in on the, uh, uh, the sheet for your uh, particular section. Okay, uh, second thing, uh, I know we're all aware, but please turn off your cell phones if you have, have one on so that we can... Uh, get through the presentation without interruption. And uh, the final thing I'd like to uh, ask is, uh, our, our speaker today, he's been here before, and he's a, uh, he talks on, on some terrific material, working directly with business and real-world applications and stuff we're talking about in class. But the best part of the presentation is always the Q&A at the end. Okay, so as he's uh, speaking and presenting, please be thinking of questions that you can bring forth uh, and let's, let's make that the best part of the, of the presentation, really take advantage of Bill's expertise on the topics that he's talking about. So, uh, and, and I think we can finish very strongly then. Uh, so, which brings me to uh, uh, our speaker for tonight. It, it really gives me great pleasure uh, to welcome uh, back here to Notre Dame, uh, Bill Marquardt. He's, um, he's a Notre Dame graduate, class of 1982, and uh, so he's, um, he's one of us. And uh, he's uh, got one son here uh, on campus now, and uh, enjoys the opportunity to come back here and, and spend time with, uh, with us here in the Notre Dame community. Um, Bill's uh, background is he's, uh, he's been a consultant for nearly 30 years, working uh, first in the, uh, in the world of the major consulting uh, with Ernst & Young, and he's on their strategy side working with, um, with the likes of Walmart and other big major corporations and uh, help create a, a, a strategic process that Walmart used uh, for multiple years, uh, three, or, three or four years, uh, and, and used it to build their profits uh, by uh, uh, multiples of, uh, I think, 600%. And, uh, and, and, and built that into a, a framework for a book uh, called Wall Smart which is basically uh, how to succeed in doing business with a, uh, with a, uh, a customer that has the, uh, the, the power and, uh, and, and, uh, and negotiating strength that a company like Walmart does. Uh, it was published here, and it's been translated into multiple languages, so he understands uh, that aspect very well. Uh, since um, uh, leaving Ernst & Young, he's uh, formed a, uh, a consultancy that he's with now uh, called Marvel Leadership Partners, and what they do is they do sustainability consulting, so they come in and work with business and uh, help them understand the long view of, of things like uh, uh, stakeholder value and corporate social responsibility, and how to build that into a, a business platform that adds value, okay, so, and that's what, he, that's what he's here to talk to us about. Uh, he's, uh, his, his business consults with a range of companies, from Disney, to AT&T, of course, Walmart, um, uh, Manpower, other big companies that, that uh, CK's expertise and, and the guidance that, that he and his team can provide. Uh, he's um, he's uh, taught at Northwestern. He's spoken at Duke. At, at, um, yes, uh, certainly Notre Dame. He's, he's presented at the White House. His work has been uh, on CNN and Wall Street Journal uh, and, and a range of other uh, business outlets that um, uh, give his uh, uh, voice, I think, more credibility in, in terms of what we're talking about here. So. Uh, without uh, taking any more of your valuable time, Bill, uh, thank you for being here. Please, uh, let's give a nice warm birthday welcome to Bill Hartley. Thanks, Professor Noah. Um, it's, it's great to be, um, to be back here for a couple of reasons. And obviously, to have the privilege to speak at and to serve uh, my university is, uh, is fantastic. Um, I have a confession to make, though. When I was here, I was a philosophy major. And I came home at the end of my freshman year, and I told my dad I was going to be a philosophy major. And dad was a lifelong truck salesman. And he 
kind of nodded at me. He went over to the kitchen counter and picked up the yellow pages and he put it in front of me on the kitchen table and he said, if you find philosophy listed in here, I'm going to pay for the rest of your education in Notre Dame. So it was kind of Dad's way of making sure that I still had some marketability and could still get a job despite the, uh, despite the background in philosophy. But what I discovered when I got into the business world, and particularly when I started the strategy practice of Ernst & Young, is that philosophy is probably one of the best um, areas and one of the best disciplines that you can take to prepare for business strategy. And the reason for that is that strategy is a lot about trying to find disparate patterns in data trying to anticipate and see what's coming up in the market and what's coming up on the horizon that, um, that the other competitors, that the other people in the marketplace don't necessarily see. And one of the things that so enthuses me about Notre Dame and the Mendoza School is the fact that you know, you've got an incredible commitment to this foresight class in, in junior year. And it, it, there's, there's a lot of parallels between the foresight class and what I learned in philosophy. Um, you know, one of the things that frustrates me about undergraduate business programs, and this is from my experience at Ernst & Young and also the Fortune 500 company I used to be an executive at, is that the vast majority of business majors exhaust their skill set within about the first five years on the job. Because you know, there's, there's a lot of, you know, you're loading yourself up with discount, uh, you know, discount, uh, discount cash flow models and P multiples, and black holes out from pricing models, and accounting rules, etc. You kind of fill in your brain with all this stuff. But once you get into the business world, after those first three or four years, what really starts to distinguish you is your ability to take the data that's out there and actually turn it into something that's progressive and thought-provoking and forward-thinking for your company. So one of the reasons that foresight is so valuable is it's really distinguishing you as business students and um, business people, once you get into that environment and you're competing against other students that have been hired from Penn, from um, Michigan and other places, you're better able to think about some of these forward-thinking ideas and opportunities. Now that being said, I'm sure foresight to a degree is frustrating. And it's, it's as frustrating as sustainability is for me, because unfortunately the answers aren't in the back of the book. One of the things about sustainability in particular is this whole field is very burgeoning and it's just beginning to grow and corporations are still wrestling with trying to understand how do I embrace sustainability, whether it's environmental sustainability or social sustainability, how do I embrace it and make it work in the company? So the presentation I'm going to share with you tonight is just some examples of how sustainability is playing the business market today. Um, the slides that you're going to see tonight and also an article that I recently wrote on, on this concept is going to be posted to the website, uh, to your course website after the lecture tonight. So you'll get, it, you know, you'll get a chance to, I'd really like you to kind of think through and, and process some of this information tonight and, rec and recognize that you're going to get the notes on it afterward. Um, but just to demonstrate the importance of foresight, I want to share with you just a couple of the trends that I see. I spent a lot of time working in the retail and consumer goods industry. And some of the things that I've been sharing with Walmart and Albertsons and other corporations, just to share with you a couple of trends that demonstrate why it's important to be able to look on the horizon and see what's coming. One of the trends that I get involved with is, is I call it who's in charge here. Let me give you a couple of data points. Um, about three years ago, the state of Maryland passed a law mandating that any corporation that had more than 40,000 employees in the state of Maryland had to uh, apply or to pay a specific percentage of their salary and set it aside for health care benefits. Interesting law, but the issue was that the only employer that actually satisfied that condition was Walmart. So the state of Maryland is passing a law with certain parameters that are specifically focused on targeting one corporation. So that's one data point. Second data point is in the wake of Hurricane Katrina and the government's failed response to Katrina, there was an entire private industry that sprung up to provide private disaster relief services in the event of a man-made natural disaster. So what you've got in this trend of who's in charge here is you've got government doing business, You've got business doing government, and you've got non-governmental organizations potentially doing both. There's a significant blurring that's occurring in the marketplace today over who's in charge and who's responsible for what. 
Second trend is that reality now has to mimic fantasy. How many of you guys watch you know, the college or pro football games and you see the sky cam, that camera that goes back and forth over the football field watching the game? Why was the sky cam invented? Does anybody know? The sky cam was invented to give us the same view of a football game that you saw when you were playing PS2. Okay, so re the reality of college and pro football video taping today and video production has to mimic the fantasy that we see in our video games. So that's just another trend, and retailers are struggling with how to, what to do with this right now. The fact that you can stand in a store like a Walmart or a Target or a Meijer and do price comparisons using your iPhone, or scan a new PC code and find out how much Amazon will charge for the exact same item. There's this blurring that's occurring, and retailers are struggling with figuring out how do we reproduce in a reality environment the fantasy or virtual world that we're getting on our smartphones and our iPhone technology. So that's just two examples of what's going on in the marketplace today that really can impact the decisions that you need to make and the corporations that you're going to be, uh, that you're going to be working for. The lecture today is going to, it's going to take place at two levels. Okay? What I want to do at a content level is I want to share with you some of the things that are going on in the sustainability environment and what's front of mind for CEOs today in major corporations. So that's at one level. But at the second level, what I want to do is I want to give you a number of data points that have occurred over the last 20 years that led me to the point that I'm at right now of um, driving a consulting business that's specifically focused on social sustainability. So at one level, we're going to talk about content, but at another level, I want to use this as an example of, of how I try to connect the dots using foresight to recognize a market opportunity that's out there right now, not only in the United States, but also in the, um, in the world. So, I want to start with this quote. In American business and in global business, we've been living under the shadow of an essay that Milton Friedman wrote just over 40 years ago in the New York Times Magazine, when he said there is one and only one social responsibility of the business, to use its resources and engage in activities designed to increase profits, so long as it stays within the rules of the game, which is to say it engages in open and free competition without deception or fraud. This is commonly known as the business of business is business. And from the time that this essay was written, literally to today, CEOs, boards of directors, senior leadership teams are living under the shadow of this statement that Milton Friedman made. What I want to do is I want to start unpacking some of the arguments that Friedman makes because it's informative in understanding where we are in business and also where the opportunities are today. First of all, Friedman is saying that the, our responsibility as business leaders is to conduct the business to make as much money as possible while conforming to basic laws of society, whether uh, customs or actually literal laws. Okay, so um, Enron, Worldcom, Tyco notwithstanding, the, business, the, the, the sole responsibility of business leaders is to make as much profit as possible as long as you stay within legal and moral boundaries. A manager of a corporation is an agent of the individuals that own the corporation. They're not principals making decisions on their own behalf. The managers of the corporation are instead agents working on behalf of the shareholders. His third point is that when an individual acts on social responsibility, he's acting as a principal, not as an agent. So if I'm the CEO of a corporation and I decide to donate a million dollars to a local charity, what I'm doing is I'm acting in my own personal stance as a principal making that investment decision, as opposed to asking, acting as an agent, acting in the best interest of the shareholders of the corporation. If a manager, therefore, has social responsibility, quote unquote, in his or her capacity as a business person, it must mean that he is to act in a way that is not in the best interest of the employer and ultimately the shareholder. When a manager acts as a principal, he's in effect posing, imposing a tax or deciding how tax proceeds are spent, yet that violates the manager's role as an agent on behalf of the, of the shareholders. Therefore, 
The doctrine of social responsibility involves acceptance of a socialist view of the business that political mechanisms rather than market mechanisms should effectively dictate how the assets of the corporation are allocated, how you allocate your scarce resources. So when you look below the hood on what Friedman had to say, he basically threw down the gauntlet and said, listen, any corporation that is doing anything in the form of social responsibility is violating its fiduciary responsibility to shareholders. And every dollar that you transfer to a social issue is basically a transfer of value away from shareholders into the pocket of stakeholders, which is a bad thing according to his, his stakeholder and shareholder theory. So the first data point that we have to deal with is this data point from Milton Friedman 40 years ago when he said that the business is business is business. And literally to this day, as I said, business executives and CEOs are living under the shadow of Friedman's argument. So, second data point, the working definition of sustainability that the United Nations Brooklyn Commission established back in 1987 said that sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. This has been, uh, I found to be a great definition and a great way with corporations to balance what their responsibilities are. Because the message here is that we, we're not going to take away from you your ability to meet and satisfy your needs of today, but we want to make sure you're not doing that at the expense of the future. One of the areas where I think this principle has been severely violated by my generation and is putting an incredible burden on your generation is the United States federal deficit. You know, when we read the, the, the press today and we're looking at raising the debt ceiling, the federal deficit is $13 trillion. That deficit is only the difference between cash inflows and cash outflows because the government does its books and records on a cash basis. And all of you that are accounting majors or have taken accounting one and two know that corporations run on an accrual basis. If you book the federal government's books and records on a gap basis and book the net present value of future liabilities, the deficit is $75 trillion. And the reason for that and the difference between 13 and 75 is the net present value of what's already been promised in entitlement payments for Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and other forms of entitlement programs. Um, you know, even you look at the you look at the big argument today over repeal of health care, and what one party is saying is that if you repeal health care, it will increase the deficit. Because don't you know the Congressional Budget Office has shown that there's a four hundred million dollar excess. Well, it's funny accounting, and it's not net present value accounting, because that calculation from the CBO assumes 10 years of increased taxes and only six years of health care benefits that are being paid out. So, of course, it's going to be a positive number. But my point is that, you know, as I look at, and, and this is one of the things I've been pushing with organizations I'm involved with and business leaders that I talk to, and David Walker with the Peterson Foundation, is this deficit issue is a, is a prime example of where we have spent so much time meeting and going beyond the needs of the present that we're not allowing genera future generations to satisfy their own needs. So we've got a second data point, which is the Brundtland Commission's definition of sustainability. Third data point, and I know a lot of you are going to begin studying this probably as early as Wednesday or Thursday this week, and it's something called the triple bottom line. How many have heard of the triple bottom line? Okay. Do you remember what the three elements of the triple bottom line are? Yes? Financial, social, and environmental. Right. Financial, social, and environmental. Sometimes it's called people, planet, and profit. Or a different way of looking at it is environmental sustainability, social sustainability, and economic sustainability. The point here when John Elkington first wrote his book and his papers back in 1993 is he was trying to raise the awareness among business executives that they have a responsibility and a motive that's just beyond profit, just beyond economic sustainability. They have a responsibility to the planet, and they have a responsibility to the people as well. So Elkington introduced the triple bottom line. This language has literally been a part of the nomenclature in business, particularly in the last 10 to 15 years. The problem and the challenge with the triple bottom line 
is it's not a good it's not necessarily a good consistent integrated solution because it introduces a corporate schizophrenia because if I'm the CEO of a corporation am I supposed to optimize profit or planet or people and when I'm facing a business decision that potentially decreases profit and increases planet or a business decision that increases people but decreases planet what am I supposed to do? There isn't a common ground, a common language, a common measurement system that allows you to integrate these three very, very disparate elements of sustainability. Um, a close friend of mine, Andy Rubin, was the architect of Walmart's sustainability strategy. He actually used to work with me at Ernst & Young. He was a senior consultant when I was a partner in strategy. And I was in San Francisco having lunch with him on Friday. And he said, Bill, you know, this was one of the single biggest challenges that we faced at Walmart, was because when we tried to apply triple bottom line thinking, we ended up with this disparity that you couldn't optimize one without having a significant impact on the other, and then there was no way to really reconcile these various, very disparate um, and, and potentially disconnected objectives. What we found is we did our research and our work was that when environmental sustainability began to become mainstream within corporations, it was when environmental sustainability became linked to economic sustainability. When doing good for the environment could also be good business. It started with companies like General Electric, when Jeff Immelt said, we intend to generate $25 million, or $25 billion of incremental revenue from environmentally friendly products. When Walmart said, I'm, we're going to increase the fuel efficiency of our distribution trucks by 10%, obviously has a benefit on the planet because it reduces carbon footprint, but oh, by the way, what that does is it reduces logistics costs because you're paying less for fuel. Or Walmart said, you know, we're going to eliminate, the, one of their goals is to eliminate the dumpster in the back of the store. Well, obviously that has an environmental benefit of reducing landfill, but at the same time, everything that's in the dumpster in the back of the store is non-value-added product cost and packaging that Walmart had to pay for, but it can't pass on to the customer in terms of pricing. Um, it was when um, Interface Carpet decided, and set a goal back in 1997, that they wanted to be carbon neutral by 2017. And today, they reduced their carbon footprint by 60%. And at the same time, profit has increased 60%, revenue has increased 60%, and profit has increased 50%. So what you've got is examples where corporations, when they began to link environmental sustainability to economic sustainability, that was where the environmental sustainability really became mainstream in corporations. What we see when we look out on the horizon is an expectation that the same thing is going to happen on the social sustainability front. When corporations begin to recognize that they can be profitable and be socially sustainable, that's when social responsibility or social sustainability is also going to become mainstream in corporations. So we've got Friedman, the Brundtland Commission, and then we've got Elkington's triple bottom line in 1993-94, and the recognition that it's linking economic and environmental sustainability that really made environmental sustainability become mainstream. Our next data point is Peter Drucker, famous management guru, and right around the time, about a year, in the last year before he passed away, Drucker made the point that every single social and global issue of our day is really a business opportunity in disguise. So what Drucker did is he gave us the encouragement. He opened our eyes to the fact that, you know, just because there's a social issue out there, there's somebody that can solve that, and there's a business imperative and a business opportunity for the organization that, that can do it. And one of the underlying premises here is that business is by far the biggest agent of world benefit that's out there. Business is inherently more effective and more efficient at capital allocation, labor allocation, etc., than governments or NGOs. So this is a recognition that business, when run properly and when run ethically, can be one of the greatest um, instigators and, and um, drivers of social change. So we add Drucker's comment from 19 or from 2004 that. There are really business opportunities in disguise when we look at social and global issues. 
Interface part that I mentioned to you, that was another data point that arose in the 1996-1997 time frame that environmental sustainability could be good business. And then I want to share with you a couple of more recent examples that we've seen in, the, um, in our work, especially with consumer companies. The first is Dan. Dan's CEO challenged his company and said, help us to solve the malnutrition problem in Bangladesh. And what Dan's, what the company did is they innovated a highly nutritious yogurt product. It's manufactured in small footprint, 7,500 square foot plants. It's manufactured from milk that's purchased from local farmers in Bangladesh. And the yogurt is distributed through the network of Grameen phone ladies that sell prepaid phone services for Grameen Bank. The product sells for seven cents a cup, and it's shelf stable, meaning it doesn't have to be refrigerated like yogurt in the United States. It's had an absolutely amazing impact on the country of Bangladesh. This is the cover of one of uh, Dan's social responsibility reports, where you see a number of women in one of the villages holding up their cups of Dan and yogurt, demonstrating the role that Dan has played and how important Dan is to the nutrition that they're able to provide for their families. What's interesting here when we analyze the Dan and case study, though, is that Dan was serving a very significant social good because they were addressing the malnutrition problem for the population of 130 million people in Bangladesh. And they were generating shareholder value. They innovated a new product. They developed a new market. And what they learned about small footprint manufacturing in these 75 square foot plants They've now taken those learnings around the globe to the larger manufacturing facilities to make those manufacturing facilities inherently more efficient. So Dan was able to find the and between social responsibility and profit because they were able to increase or improve malnutrition and were able to innovate a new product, develop a new market, and drive operational efficiencies to their business. About nine months ago, Dan took this exact same yogurt product and introduced it into the French market as an opening price point yogurt product that sold at the equivalent of like an Aldi or a Dollar General here in the United States. So now, they've not only taken this into Bangladesh, but they're now using it as a platform that they can use around the world for growth in, in a bargain segment of the, uh, of the yogurt market. So another data point that we add up here is Dan's Bangladesh yogurt business. And then we've got a, another data point. Uh, this picture is of the village of Santa Cruz in Guatemala. Santa Cruz is about two hours northeast of Guatemala City. It's up in the mountains. It's an incredibly rich, fertile area. Um, I've, uh, my wife and my son and I have done some some work in the village and visited it a few times. And it's incredible when you go through this agricultural land. They're growing broccoli, carrots, uh, radishes, potatoes, um, tomatoes, a whole variety of, of products. Guatemala is known as the land of eternal spring because the temperatures almost all year are in the 80 82 year old or 80 82 bracket. So you can plant radishes and go from seed to harvest in only 30 days. So it's, it's an amazing, amazing area for agriculture. However, when we walk into the village of Santa Cruz, what we see is abject poverty. We see families of eight living on $2 a day family income. On an average education level of third grade, uh, we visited one family where there was a five-year-old girl that weighed 31 pounds because she only ate if her dad worked in the field that day and earned his two dollars. So there's this incredible dichotomy in Santa Cruz between rich fertile farmland and the abject poverty. And where I finally got an understanding of what was going on is when the middleman came to town. What happens is the middlemen come to town sporadically, they buy the produce for 10 cents on the dollar of what it's worth at the market, they take it to market and market up and sell it. So what you've got is the, the villagers in Santa Cruz have no ready access to market. 
And as a result, they're never able to grow out of extreme poverty because they're never able to get the benefit of what they're producing and the middlemen are getting it all. So Walmart formed the Inclusive Market Alliance to Rural Entrepreneurs, or MARE, and they did it in conjunction with USAID and Mercy Corps. What happens is USAID provides funding, Mercy Corps trains the farmers in basic agricultural practices, invoicing, etc. Walmart agrees to purchase the product at market prices and gives demand statistics to the village and says, okay, I had this many radishes at this time and I had this much tomatoes, this many carrots. And as a result, the villagers benefit because they get steady demand for their product at market pricing. Walmart benefits because they have a consistent source of locally grown produce, i.e. more sales. And also they're able to lower their logistics costs because instead of trucking the carrots six hours from Mexico, they're only trucking the carrots two hours from the villages at like Santa Cruz, and therefore the logistics costs for getting that product to market are lower. So Walmart was able to satisfy both the fiduciary responsibility or shareholder value responsibility at the same time that they were serving the social good. So what that did was that gave us one more data point uh, in the, from the alliance in 2008 to 2009 timeframe of corporations that were, uh, that were getting actively involved in social responsibility. So we looked at this map. <coughs> And we start with Milton Friedman challenging us that the business of business is business, and anything you can do in social responsibility to transfer the value away from the shareholders is inappropriate. We have the Brunton Commission defining sustainability. We have Elkington's triple bottom line, which was interested in raising the awareness of people and planet issues, but which didn't give us a way to necessarily meld those opportunities together in a way that CEOs and boards of directors could really act on. We have Drucker challenging us that every social and global issue of our day is a business opportunity in disguise. Interface Carpet proving that it could increase sales and profit by being socially responsible. We had Dan solving a social issue and innovating products and markets. And we have Walmart reducing its logistics costs and increasing its sales while also serving indigenous Guatemalan farmers. So as we look at these data points, where do you think, what do you, what do you see as a potential market opportunity and a potential way to help corporations mesh and connect these dots together? Any ideas? Yes? Uh, dealing with the energy practice would be one area. Okay. So applying some of these issues to deal with to deal with the energy crisis that we're facing today or maybe facing down the line. Okay. What other opportunities do you potentially see? Assume that you're consulting for one of these major corporations and you've got these data points. What do you see as the opportunity? Yes, Opportunities outside the U.S. because in the Bangladesh situation and in the Dan situation, the Walmart situation, there are clearly foreign opportunities, and there's also some great examples of domestic opportunities as well. I'll give you another um, another uh, data point. Um, Walgreens, uh, uh, Randy Lewis, who actually used to be a partner of mine at Ernst and Young, is now head of supply chain for Walgreens. Randy has a son that suffers from autism. <laughs> And he really was struggling with, what does my son do when he becomes 18 next year? Where, where does he get employed? He's becoming an adult. There aren't job opportunities. And you know, one of the sad parts in the American economic system is that the unemployment rate among the, the permanently the, the disabled is about 40% in terms of um, the, the number of people that are disabled and unemployed versus the total disabled population. So what Randy did is he opened a distribution center for Walgreens in, uh, in South Carolina. And what he did was he set a goal of making at least 40% of the production jobs in the distribution center be open to and hiring either cognitively or physically disabled Americans. 
And as a result, they had to do some accommodations and some changes in the flow labs, some changes in the way that they, that they did things. But lo and behold, since Randy opened that distribution center in Anderson, South Carolina, two years ago, the productivity rate and profitability of that distribution center is higher than the average for all of Walgreens distribution centers around the country. Because what they found was that the turnover rate for their employees is much lower. Employee engagement and commitment to their jobs and their interest in doing a great job, their, their engagement and productivity is much higher. And the, the experiment that Randy launched was so successful that they opened a second distribution center in, in Connecticut last year with the same principles. And now Walgreens has committed that at least 10% of its production jobs and distribution centers around the country are going to be filled by people with disabilities. So what they found was that even not just in a foreign country, but domestically, there are ways to solve social issues, but also do it in a way that can be accretive to an increased shareholder value. And as we connected these dots together, that's what we found. The market opportunity from connecting these disparate data points is to find the and between profit and social responsibility that the winning corporations in this emerging economy are the ones that are able to generate innovation, growth, and shareholder value by using the assets of the core business to solve and address major social issues. So you had Dan, which drove an increase in sales of yogurt and operating efficiencies by addressing the malnutrition problem in Bangladesh using the assets of the core business. You had Walgreens addressing the social issue of the high unemployment rate among disabled Americans by increasing the productivity in its warehouses, part of its core business, thereby addressing the disabled population. Same thing with, with the Walgreens, or with the uh, Walmart example. Marriott started something called the Pathways to Independence Program where they find welfare to work moms, um, immigrant workers, people who are basically at the very bottom of the, the, the supply chain, if you will, of labor in the United States. And what they do is they specifically have an outreach to these potential employees. They bring them into entry-level jobs within a Marriott property. They're mentored by managers in those same facilities. And what they found is it's improved profitability in their hotels because the turnover rate for these employees is much lower and the dedication rate is much higher. So what we found is that the key and the emerging trend that's coming up on the horizon as we use our foresight to develop a new consulting capacity is to help corporations find the end between profit and social responsibility. So I want to talk about this a little bit about the approach. How do, you, how do we do this in consulting? What are the four stages that a corporation goes through in finding the end? And then just give you a couple more examples before we go to questions. Okay. The key in finding the end is taking the corporate social responsibility and flipping it into an opportunity, and then using that opportunity to generate sustainable competitive advantage. So Walgreens took the responsibility to this disabled, turned it into an opportunity to, to end up um, creating and training a very specialized workforce and use that to drive productivity within the business. So the essence is to not look at social issues as responsibilities, but instead to apply Drucker's lens and turn them into opportunities. There are two ways to potentially do this. One is the inside-out approach. Start with a business need and ask the question, how do we service this business need and generate a social good? So the Walmart example, they started with how do we reduce logistics costs and, by the way, help indigenous Guatemalan farmers. Country Guatemala, 8 million to 13 million population, live on $2 a day or less. And of all the nations in North and South America, it's ranked the lowest on the United Nations Team of Development Index. So there's a huge social opportunity there if the problem is solved. The other way of applying and finding the end is to use an outside-in approach. To start with a social need and ask the question, how do we solve and address that social need and generate shareholder value? That was the Dan example. Because Dan's CEO started with, 
let's solve the malnutrition problem in Bangladesh, and then flip from there to an, how do we do it in a way that's actually increasing profit for our organization. What's interesting about this, and you'll see the word constraint up there, is that it's when you introduce constraints into a strategic planning process that you drive innovation and growth. One of my favorite examples is Southwest Airlines. When Southwest Airlines first started, it had four airplanes. It was running out of cash. They had to sell an airplane to raise enough money to keep the company going. One of their executives said, how can we service the same airline schedule with 25% fewer airplanes? And that was the constraint that drove the innovative 30-minute gate turnaround time, the boarding process, the way they load and unload planes at Southwestern airports. All of that was driven by constraining and saying, how do we do this, the original schedule, and do it with 25% fewer airplanes? So the issue is, and the challenge, is introducing a constraint into the strategic planning process. Walmart put in that constraint, Walgreens put in the constraint, Marriott, Dan, etc. It's introducing the constraint and designing around it that really is the source of innovation and growth in any strategic planning process. When you make corporate social responsibility issues that constraint, what it does is it introduces a new lens to the strategic planning process that enables you to solve these problems. What you'll find, and you'll probably see this as you get into your business careers, that in the midst of a recession, most CEOs believe that he or she can cost cut their way to prosperity. And that only lasts for a certain period of time. And there's a point and an inflection point in every economic recovery where the CEO starts asking the growth question. How do we grow our top line? How do we grow? How do we innovate? And what's interesting is that finding the end is actually a new lens that CEOs have not traditionally used. I mean, coming out of the last economic dip, which was when the, um, the dot-com bubble burst in the 2001-2002 time frame, this issue of social responsibility as a source of shareholder value didn't exist. So as you're looking at the job market, as you're moving into corporations over the next couple of years, this provides a unique way of looking at the corporations and looking at growth opportunities that even the CEOs of your companies probably haven't looked at in a, in a lens that they haven't looked through before. Now, what we also find is that corporations generally go through four stages of finding the end. The first stage is the pure philanthropy stage. This is where there's very little alignment between a corporation's philanthropic activities and its business strategy. Um, you know, what you'll find is one of the reasons that $50,000 a year goes to the orchestra is because the CEO's spouse sits on the orchestra board. Um, there are a lot of decisions made in corporations today that aren't aligned, at least when it comes to philanthropy, that aren't aligned with their strategy and their business direction. And this is probably the closest to what Milton Friedman was criticizing 40 years ago when he talked about a transfer of value from a corporation away from shareholders to other stakeholders. Most corporations today are emerging into what I'll call strategic philanthropy. They're trying to align their giving and their social responsibility activities closer to their business strategy. My alma mater, Ernst & Young, has basically focused most of its activities on three E's. Education, environment, and entrepreneurship. Education because it's critical to the ongoing growth and stimulation of the economy. Environmental, because it's front of mind and the right thing to do from a stewardship perspective. And entrepreneurship, because they're the founders of the Entrepreneur of the Year Award Program. So it's consistent with their business strategy to invest and focus a lot of their philanthropic activities in those three areas. My favorite example is PetSmart. Fifteen years ago, PetSmart decided to focus virtually all of its philanthropic activities on adopted pet programs, avoiding the euthanasia of, of homeless pets. Well, if you think about it, um, a pet rescue, um, rescuing homeless pets is clearly consistent with their employee strategy because their employees are pet lovers. It's consistent with their customer strategy because their customers love pets. Since the program started, there are also 4 million dogs and cats that have been saved that need food and toys. 
So by focusing its philanthropy on Dr. Peck program, it's a creative to shareholder value because it's consistent with the business that they're generating downstream. What's also interesting about this from a business perspective is when I work with corporations on business strategy, I always tell them the first step in strategic planning is deciding what you're going to say no to. Because every organization has more ideas than it has the resources of time and money to deliver on them. And being able to have a specific explicit strategy gives you the ability to say no to many other worthwhile things. Rather than going broad and shallow, it gives you the opportunity to go narrow and deep. One of the things that um, PetSmart's CEO told me is he said the beauty of our strategy is when somebody comes to us with a very worthwhile cause, we're able to say, listen, we really commend you for what you're doing. We think you've got a great cause. However, it doesn't fit the strategy of what we're trying to accomplish in the way we've decided to focus our business, and we're not going to be in a position to support you. It, it's not, therefore, an arbitrary yes or no, but it gives them the ability to focus their resources in a way that make a very significant difference. What's oftentimes missing, though, at this level is a feedback loop. Corporations get involved in strategic philanthropy, but they don't use that as an opportunity to reinform their business, their market research, and their business strategy. Virtually every major bank in America is involved in financial literacy programs, you know, teaching basic budgeting and savings and things like that, particularly in impoverished areas. But none of them built in a feedback loop to really understand the needs of unbanked and underbanked Americans. 12% of America right now is either unbanked or underbanked. It took upstarts like NetSend and GreenDot to basically create the prepaid debit card market that's a multi-billion dollar market today. They created what the banks could have created if they were paying attention to the feedback loops implicit in what they were doing in their strategic philanthropy activities. Third level, the third stage of finding the end is strategic sustainability. This is where you're addressing major social issues discreetly and on a tactical basis within the fabric of your core business. So the Dan example, the Walmart example, the Walgreens example are all examples of using the assets of the core business to solve a major social need. There are a handful of companies which have hit the top level, the advantage um, level. And this is where finding the and is embedded within the strategy and the operations of the business. Um, these are uh, Whole Foods, Patagonia, REI, Green Mountain Coffee Roasters, companies where consideration of social issues is embedded in each of the strategic decisions that they make and is therefore really a part um, of their brand. What's interesting about the chart is the one thing I want you to take away from this is to look at this dotted line through the middle. These two levels of activity are taking place in the philanthropy department, in the philanthropy space. Whereas the two phases above are taking place in the core business. In these two, these two phases are generally pushed off to a foundation, to a CSR department, to some the communications department, community relations, some staff department within the organization. These two are taking place with the core operators of the business, the people that are running plants, the people that are running marketing, the people that are running the business, because the greatest shareholder value tends to come when you're solving these issues within the fabric of the, uh, of the core business. What's also interesting then is when you look at this dotted line, the things that are happening below the line are costs of doing business. Whereas the things that buffer line are really sources of profit and shareholder value growth. So, some examples of companies that are finding the end. We talked about Dan, market development, product innovation, operational efficiency. Also, from one of my clients, um, also is the largest provider of social security disability representation services in the country. Um, if once you've worked for five years and you've paid into social security, if you become permanently disabled, you're able to apply to Social Security and you receive between $1,000 and $2,000 a month until retirement age um, because of the fact that you can no longer work. If you or I were to walk into a Social Security office on our own and apply, two-thirds of the time we're rejected because we don't understand the system. My client also, 98% of their um, customers get Social Security benefits because they understand the system. They understand how to put medical records together. They understand how to make the case. 
But what we realized when we were doing the market research is there was a tremendous range of financial and healthcare needs that disabled Americans face. They didn't have any way to do financial planning. They didn't have a way to tap into assets like 401k and life insurance policies that can fund activities of daily living. They needed a way to pick the right Medicare plan because when you're disabled, you're eligible for Medicare way before 65. We created an entire portfolio of financial and healthcare services for also that has increased our profit by over 50% in the last four years. So we were able to develop a new market, innovate a new product, and we're able to tear down the barriers and silos as a corporation because everybody's working together to develop these projects and these, these new programs and therefore we're building culture. I told you the Walgreens example before, which is a case of operational efficiency as well as culture building. And then PetSmart, which, you know, through its adopted pet program, was doing um, market development um, as well as um, culture building as well. So what's interesting is when we start to apply finding in, you push one or more of four levers of shareholder value, market development, product innovation, operational efficiency, and culture building. So, and I'm going to give you one last example before we open it up for questions. This is actually a project that I'm um, working on right now when we're actually in the fundraising stages to create a for-profit business. The need that we've identified, the social need that we've, that we've seen, is that 23 million Americans live in what are called food deserts in the urban core of major American cities. And a food desert is defined as an area that doesn't have any access to conventional grocery stores within at least two miles of your home. So whereas in the world I used to go into Martins or Meyer or Kroger or Safeway or Dominic's or Jewel or wherever we happen to live, in the vast majority of our urban core areas, there's no access to fresh and healthy food in conventional grocery stores. If that's the case, where, where do you think people are shopping that live in food deserts? 7-Eleven to stop shopping at convenience stores, gas stations, liquor stores, and fast food. Well, there's a 35% higher incidence of health-related disease for people that live in food deserts because of the lack of access to healthy food. There's a need in our urban core for workforce development because there's a lot of workforce development going on now for jobs that don't exist. I know one church in Chicago that just uh, finished this incredible workforce development program to train people to refurbish and to remove and refurbish equipment from PCs and then redeploy them into new personal computers. They never bother to check that there's no market for that. Nobody's doing that right now. So there's workforce development going on, but it's for jobs that don't exist. There's a 60% recidivism rate on ex-offenders. The likelihood you're going to be back in prison within three years after committing to prison is 60%. Again, because there's no job to go back to and no job training. There's a lack of the ability to retain and build capital within the urban core. There's also a significant need for a return to moral and ethical values in our cities as well. The sociologists were wrong in 1960 when they told us that crime is a poverty problem because the recent research has shown that crime, crime is an ethical problem. Crime is a matter of people making the wrong moral choices. And the single biggest determinant of somebody ending up in prison is lack of moral training in the form of a five to ten year um, age, age frame. So we've got these incredible needs in the urban core, but we're trying to figure out where's the end. And our aha was um, when we met us, when we found a store in Baltimore, Maryland called Gary's Goods. How many live, live in Baltimore or that area? Okay. In the Sandtown neighborhood of Baltimore, which is a tough area in, in Baltimore, there's a church called New Song. Uh, New Song administers to about a 15 square block area. New Song decided that it wanted to try to redeem the urban core of the city. So it opened up a retail store called Gary's Goods. Um, it's run by um, Gary and Antoine. And what you see is when you look at the outside of the store here, they took the worst street corner in the neighborhood with the highest incidence of violent crime and they refurbished an abandoned building and turned it into a store. Now, this is the middle of a food desert. There is no conventional grocery store. There's no Aldi. There's no Sable Lab. There's no Dollar General. The only place that you can buy food, I call them plexiglass stores. They're little convenience stores where you walk up to bulletproof glass, you put your cash underneath, 
and they hand you your product underneath the glass, and that's the way you transact business. You're not allowed to actually walk in the store because you could be too much of, of a threat for them. So they pick the most violent street corner in the city of Baltimore, and they pick Gary and Antoine to run the store. Gary used to sell crack cocaine on this corner. Antoine shot a guy in this corner and went to prison. And both of them have come back into their neighborhood as entrepreneurs to try to serve the very community that they were ripping off and that they were terrorizing a number of years ago. What's interesting, I, I spent, um, I've been spending some time with Gary and Antoine, and Antoine told me a story about one of the drug dealers in the neighborhood called Albert, who confronted him on the street, kind of gave him the, you know, the finger in the chest, and Antoine didn't know what was coming down. And Albert said, you know, I want you to know you're my hero. You're my role model. And Antoine said, you know, what about? He said, you guys are doing for this community what we wish we were doing, but we're so stuck in the drug trade, we can't get out of it, and we can't do anything to earn a legitimate living. So the good news is, not only has there not been a single violent crime on the street corner in the two years since Gary's Goods has opened, but the two plexiglass stores in the neighborhood have been robbed, and Gary's hasn't been robbed yet. In fact, the, uh, there, was a, there was a customer that was trying to walk out with a case of Pepsi, and another customer stopped him at the door and says, you better put that back unless you're going to pay for it. So by, by respecting the people in the community, by respecting the customer, by allowing them to walk into the store, you, what you're doing is you're raising the level of awareness and raising the level of respect that they have for the store itself. So what's the problem? Gary loses money every week because church doesn't know how to run retail. They've got a great concept, they've got a great idea, but the store isn't merchandised properly. It doesn't have the right products in the store. It doesn't have the right economic model, and therefore it's not sustainable. So we're in the process of doing it right now, and we actually have a grant where we're trying to raise private capital. We also have a grant before the USDA right now, is we're raising money to create a turnkey store in a box concept that churches can sponsor into food deserts in urban core neighborhoods. And it's a turnkey. Here's the merchandise, here's the wagon, here's the refrigeration equipment, here's what you, here are the pricing, here's the training, everything. All you have to do as a church or a ministry organization is sponsor it into the community. What we're able to do is to build up the self-worth and dignity for customers and employees because they're able to transact business in the store. They're treated with respect when they walk in. It's a source of workforce development and healthy role models just like Antoine and Gary are within their neighborhood. Within their neighborhood. Because it's a franchise concept, we're, able, we're able, enabling the owners to actually build wealth and build capital in the urban core by running good businesses and earning a profit. And we're also in, in working through how we have the employees in the store actually work with uh, the church to do regular basic training on values-based leadership principles and Judeo-Christian principles of, of business, etc. We're also working on a workforce development idea where if somebody works in the store for a year, they would automatically qualify for a job at Jewel or Dominix or Walmart. So there's a career progression out of this sort of concept and launches them in a career. It's an and for those corporations and those retailers because they're able to get trained employees that have worked in the retail environment for at least a year before they, before they get started. So this is another example. It's, it's a finding in hand. We purposely have not set this up as a not-for-profit. Because generally speaking, not-for-profits sustain only until the funding stops. It's the same. It's, you know, there's lots of programs in Chicago and in New York for um, vegetable carts to try to deal with the healthy food issue in our urban core cities. But as soon as the funding gives way, the carts go away, and it's not a sustainable model. So we've set this up as a for-profit corporation to make it sustainable, and also to set a standard and an example for what it means to run a for-profit business among our franchisees. So, we talked about things happening at, um, at two levels in the presentation today. From a content perspective, what I wanted to do is share with you some of the things that are going on in social and environmental sustainability. Okay? But secondly, I wanted to show you how we were able to connect the disparate data points of everything from the triple bottom line to Milton Friedman to Walmart to Walgreens and connect those dots together to create a new way for corporations to look at strategy, innovation, and shareholder value. 
Questions? Yes, sir. All the other companies that you help, um, you help them on their one of their smaller parts of their businesses. Um, is there any example where you <coughs> potentially be helping the main business? Well, in, all, in the situations I gave you, like Danon and Walgreens and Walmart, and also, um, we're in the midst of the core business because we're dealing with their distribution centers. In the case of also, we're dealing with their customer relations uh, people, etc. What we're finding, though, is that if you look at I'm going to go back to the stages here for a second. What we're finding on the stages is that most corporations today are operating at the level of strategic philanthropy, kind of like a touch mark. Okay? And they're only beginning to emerge into this area where they're dabbling in it. It's very tough for an established corporation to make the jump from here to up here. Because if you think about REI and, and Whole Foods and Green Mountain, et cetera, um, they all started with uh, social responsibility being part of the fabric of the business. There aren't many case studies yet of corporations that have made that full migration to an advantage. Also, they're getting close. Um, they still need to go a little bit further, but they're getting close on it. What we're seeing, where the opportunity is, especially for you and for us, is to help corporations be more strategic in their philanthropy and open the door to discrete examples of where they're able to do strategic sustainability. Um, for example, right now, Abbott um, Labs has got some real interesting nutritional products that, um, that they think have applicability in Southeast Asia. And they're beginning to come up with brand new and radically different distribution mechanisms in order to try to get that product out where it's useful and, and, and where it can be um, sort of social good as well as profitable. But again, that's, they're not doing that globally, they're doing that in the discrete setting of the business. It's more like most corporations need to take a taste of it before they're ready to make that big jump. Uh, how exactly um, do you find the and? Uh, it kind of makes sense when you're kind of a consumer facing business, but how does a business that operates in a B2B environment, such as you know, big industrial or something like that, find the and? Sure, great, great question. Um, it's, it's easier to see those examples and they're more prevalent in the consumer products industry, which is why I tend to use those. I've got one client that specializes in um, writing workers' compensation insurance policies for high-risk industries. So they underwrite longshoremen and commercial construction workers and things like that. Things with very, very difficult workers' compensation claims. <coughs> One of the things that we've you know, talked about with them is, you know, as they focus their philanthropic dollars, and this is more strategic philanthropy still, but why not sponsor programs that are dealing with the crisis family issues that um, longshoremen families face. Because oftentimes there's a lot of, there's family violence, there's fracture and breakups in families. If you're in an offshore drilling environment, you're away for three or four months before you come back home. So should they invest in some type of family counseling, providing family counseling for the ultimate customers of their customers, the, the workers who are being insured, and does that give them a competitive advantage so that when they're trying to underwrite workers' comp for an oil company and they're competing against somebody else, this is at least a tiebreaker or a differentiator that what they've done is taken their philanthropic dollars and invested it in something that's ultimately to the benefit of their b b customer's customer. So that's uh, one example. On the environmental side, you've got companies like Fairmont Minerals in um, the Cleveland area which really embraced this whole idea of environmental sustainability and made it integral to their core business. And what's happened is they're getting into bid situations like in the state of Wisconsin. What they do is they, uh, they mine for basic minerals, especially silica and things like that. There was one bid where the state didn't even accept bids from anybody else because Fairmont's reputation for the way it took care of the environment was so great it was a no-brainer to, uh, to hire them. So there are examples 
in the environmental side, on the social side, those are just beginning to emerge. Other questions? While we're waiting for while we're waiting, while we're waiting for hands to go up, one of the other questions I, I was lecturing in um, a couple of classes earlier today, and somebody raised the question, well, yeah, but so what? I'm going to you know work in a corporation, I'm not operating at these levels, um, I'm not in a position to really move the needle and accomplish anything. And I would challenge you, I would challenge the, that assumption. Because um, as, as we're building a consulting firm to do this, I frequently have mused that our, the, the, the people that will do this kind of consulting are 50 somethings that have finished their business career and want to change the world, and 20 somethings coming out of college and want to change the world. And we probably want to have a lot of people in that in between bracket actually working on it. Where you have the opportunities, you've got an incredibly fresh perspective. And, and your generation, when you look at the research, has a much greater focus, and you may have even heard the term Generation G, a much greater focus on giving and a much greater focus on being outwardly focused because of what you watched us as our parents do wrong. Um, you bring a fresh perspective and a fresh lens to these corporations that their senior executives don't necessarily have. And where you can make a difference is a couple ways. If you've got a company that you're working for that's engaged totally in pure philanthropy, you can raise the suggestion of, gee, why don't we take some of our philanthropic money and invest it here because it's going to be more strategic and more consistent with our business. If you get involved in strategic philanthropy for your corporation, but there's no feedback loop, ask the question, well, shouldn't we be putting a feedback loop? What are we learning from this strategic philanthropic activity that we could be taking back to make a difference in our core business? I'd also suggest that this concept of finding the and is not just applicable to social sustainability, but in any business meeting that you're in, any challenge that you have, when you're at loggerheads between should we do A or B, throw out on the table, is there a way to do an hand? Just like that, that um, the person did at Southwest Airlines. Because that revolutionized the business and vaulted Southwest to where it is today as a leader in an industry that keeps going into bankruptcy. So I'd encourage you to use that finding the hand approach and that lens to try to figure out if there's a way to merge two things together that may appear on the face of the mutually exclusive. Uh, do you have a question? Um, yeah, I had a question about our um, view of Friedman. Uh, do you think he's unfairly criticized in the sense that uh, he suggested that profit should be earned legally and ethically, and people forget that part of what he said? This is a problem that we really um, haven't expected people to behave in an ethical fashion in regard to social issues and environmental issues. And this is the problem the fact that we have not been uh, innovative enough in determining how to make progress. I, I, think that, I think there's a lot of validity to that. I mean, the, the, you're right, the good news is Freeman's comment was the fact that he was drawing boundaries. That businesses have to operate on ethical, more you know, ethical principles, not just legal principles, but ethical principles as well. Because of the fact that he basically denigrated social responsibility, that's what he ends up coming under a lot of criticism and this umbrella that, that we've been living under for 40 years tends to impact us or make us, make us gunshot, if you will. What, what's, um, what's interesting, I'll, I'll leave you with two things in, um, in closing, because I know we're getting close. Um, you're in a very interesting position in the university, because in this university, think about the advertising campaign. You know, the what are you fighting for campaign that we see so frequently on, on television. You know, that's a great example. That's a challenge for which finding the end is an answer. And when you look at your, you know, uh, your alumnus that took the shipping containers and turned them into homes, you know, think, you know that's a finding the end. Because it not only would have been an environmental problem to have these things shredded up or trashed, but the corporations that had them were trying to figure out some way to get economic utility out of the shipping containers. So they not only solved the business problem, but they also solved the social problem of creating um, better housing. So, you know, so first of all, you've got this tremendous opportunity because of what the university stands for and its values. You know, the second thing is, um, and I, I actually had a lot of discussions earlier today with some of the business ethics faculty, um, because there's a real good DVD series coming out um, soon that features Chuck Wilson and Brick Hume and Ben Stein and others 
wrestling with this issue of doing the right thing and developing a whole concept of, of ethics and business ethics. And one of the points that Ben Stein makes very early on is when you look at the financial meltdown that occurred two years ago, there was a breakdown of moral and ethical decision making literally every step of the way. You had individuals taking out mortgages that they knew they couldn't afford, which was an ethical problem. You had banks packaging and selling mortgages in order to keep the fees, knowing that those mortgages wouldn't be paid back. You had investment banks and AIG taking bets on both sides of the transaction, both sides of the equation. You had Fannie and Freddie propping up this marketplace, you know, ostensibly influenced, at least in some part, based upon political donations that were being made to, to politicians. You had an ethical breakdown in government, you had it in investment banks, you had it in insurance companies, you had it in mortgage companies, you had it in individuals. So when you, when you talk about and look at Friedman's statement, you know, forgetting the social responsibility angle, did any one of those players stay within the moral and legal rules of the game? And look where it left us as an economy and a country, and look at the devastation it left us from a financial perspective. So, we got time for one last question. Yes, sir. Uh, what role do you see the government playing in terms of uh, uh, in terms of encouraging sort of strategic philanthropy? Um, well, if you if you look at what's going on in Congress right now, is they're wrestling with the potential reform of the tax code. One of the very real discussion points is to eliminate the deduction for philanthropic contributions. Uh, you know, there's a move afoot to eliminate the mortgage interest deduction. There's also a move so. From a tax policy perspective, there could be a significant shot across the bow, at least as it relates to philanthropy. Obviously, there are a lot of special interest that can involve a lot of the time. Um, Jim Wallace, I think what's interesting is a, a challenge for you all. Jim Wallace, who's with Sojourner, she wrote the book, God's Politics, Why the Left Gets It Wrong and the Right Doesn't Get It. It's a fascinating book if you get a chance to, to read it. But Wallace makes the point that if you want to change culture and society, you don't change the politicians. You change the direction that the wind is blowing with the social movement and the politicians will follow. And you know, the example, one of the examples he uses is Martin Luther King. When Martin Luther King came back from his Nobel Prize um, award and met with President Johnson, Johnson said, listen, there's no way we're going to be able to get civil rights legislation passed because I've spent every ounce of political capital I have with Southern senators and congressmen. There's no way you're going to get this through. Six months later, the civil rights legislation passed because society and culture had so worked for it and demanded it that the politicians ended up following suit. So the onus is, you know, if, if you believe in this material, if you believe in, in finding that hand, it really starts with me, it starts with you, and it starts with us as a citizenry being part of the movement that drives this because the government isn't going to lead it, but the government will follow in the direction of it. I'll, I'll stay afterward if you've got any individual questions, I'd be glad to answer them. But